Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to this uh, session about um, Asia Security Outlook. Um, my name is Espen Bart Eide. I'm Managing Director at the World Economic Forum, uh, head of the Center for Global Strategies, and one of my responsibilities is to uh, further develop the work of the forum on uh, geopolitics, geoeconomy, and security. And this is, I think, a very uh, topical uh, area of interest for the forum, given the way that the world is developing. In my former life, I was uh, both Defense Minister and Foreign Minister of Norway, and I've been engaged with this region in many different uh, capacities. I'm very glad to be with uh, you today. Uh, we have an excellent uh, panel with us today. Uh, we have um, Dr. Rudiger Frank, who is uh, Department Head and Professor of East Asian Economy uh, and Society at the University of Vienna, and also the Head of the Department of East Asian Studies. Um, we have uh, Laura Del Rosario, who is Under Secretary, International Economic Relations, Department of Foreign Affairs here. We have, uh, uh, very glad to have with us um, <clears throat> Admiral uh, Samuel uh, Locklear, number three, uh, three who is, the, who is um, uh, the commander of the Pacific uh, for, the, for the United States uh, uh, military. Uh, very important role, I think, under your responsibility is for 52% of the world's uh, territory, uh, which means the, uh, your older colleagues have uh, shared the older 48%, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, which is uh, rather uh, uh, impressive. Uh, Shiego Iwatani is the Secretary General of the Trilateral Cooperation Secretariat. Very nice uh, that you're with us, based in Seoul. And then, um, uh, of course, Parag Khanna, who's Senior Fellow with the New American Foundation, currently based in, uh, in Singapore, uh, and uh, uh, adjunct professor Lee Can Yu School of Public Policy, but somebody who's based both in Washington, London, and Singapore, old world, new world. Uh, very happy to have you with us as well. And just as a point of introduction to the theme, I think that uh, it's fair to say that the East Asian and Southeast Asian security dynamics will be to the 21st century what Europe was to the 20th century, for good and bad. You know, as, as uh, developments in and over Europe, not necessarily originating in Europe, but very much playing out in Europe in the 20th century was defining the state of the world. And the, going from Cold War to a post-Cold War setting, the two world wars uh, prior to that, I think today the security dynamics of Asia are of global relevance, not only of regional relevance. So if, uh, if this region is developing to, into more strategic competition, that's probably a quite alarming development for global affairs. If one is able to build strategic trust between May players in this region, that will have a positive impact on the global scene. So that's very much the, the kind of broad landscape. And just to, to, um, uh, to start us off, uh, the <coughs> reminding ourselves of the dynamics of the situation uh, around us, uh, we had the military coup last night in Thailand, uh, continuing on uh, the already established martial law. We had uh, a bomb attack in China, uh, related probably to the issues of Uyghurs and, and uh, mainland uh, Chinese. We had uh, North Korean uh, shells uh, aiming at the South Korean ship. This is all just yesterday. And we, of course, have the lingering uh, conflicts around both the East China Sea, the issues between Japan and China, and we have the South uh, China Sea issues of uh, maritime competition disputes uh, about how to manage this area. So there's a broad... Uh, specter of issues and I would like to encourage us now to take a strategic perspective begin with the big picture and see what are sort of the main lines of development let's start with the problem and then move towards solutions eventually and I want to invite uh, Dr. Rudiger Frank to start us off are we seeing Cold War 2.0 coming? Yeah thank you this is basically what I was uh, going to say I think the pink elephant in the room is clearly China it's rising and um, at least for neorealist scholars it's quite clear that if one side's power is increasing somebody else's power has to decrease that leads to dynamics that are very obvious to everybody especially in Southeast Asia so I don't think I have to expand on that very much this situation is bad enough but I think especially for countries that are not big powers like not China or the US the question is how do you react to that um, so far, I think all this is taking place more or less in a bilateral way. Uh, what worries me is that indeed we will see a formation of camps again, as we have seen that in the second half of the 20th century. And then um, smaller, medium-sized countries will not have a chance to really independently decide what they want to do. They will be asked to, to join. And that's a question that's very hard to answer because it usually includes uh, trade-offs, e economic trade-offs as well. And... Um, 
so this is what I really worry about. Just think about <clears throat> transnational corporations right now more or less being present globally, having to redefine their position in another two or three way competition in the world. You have to close down presences, you have to open up other ones. You have to think about your uh, supply chains, you have to think about your distribution networks. You will have more competition uh, inside of, the, of those newly formed blocks. You will have a different type of competition between blocks. You will have all kinds of completely different strategic implications that will seriously affect the way how we conduct business. Not only, uh, of course, uh, speaking about the security environment. And being a specialist on <coughs> North Korea in particular, of course, you wonder how those countries will actually react to that. I think in particular, someone like North Korea will actually benefit from a Cold War 2.0. Uh, they will find themselves back again inside of one camp where they will be under the umbrella um, that is formed where their leverage will definitely increase. And if you see recent developments, um, especially improvement of relations between Russia and North Korea for, for giving 90% of their debt. Um, on the other hand, also joint military exercises between Russia and China just recently. All that seems to point in a direction that I find very disturbing. I think there's also a way out, but uh, I think for framing the problem, that should be enough for the moment. Thank you very much. So that's a, that's a very interesting start. Let me just quickly challenge that with one, one line, because the original Cold War was a competi geopolitical competition of influence, but it was also a competition between economic systems. Do we see this second uh, today as well, or is there a difference? Because actually Russia and China both have embraced capitalism in a sense, uh, so that you know, the, the mutual dependence is higher than it was back in the Cold War days. Oh, I strongly believe that this will, that will also involve an ideological competition, mm -hmm. perhaps not between socialism and capitalism, but between different forms of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So that is quite clear that we also see that. Um, certainly an emphasis more on a centralized, state-led economic development, an emphasis on welfare uh, and all these things, even leading to how democracies are being created. Different kinds of countries all call themselves democratic. So I clearly see room even for ideological competition in those fields. Okay. To, to stay on that one, uh, do you agree with this? Uh, <coughs> largely, I think what, what Professor Frank has said that is most significant is uh, the role of uh, traditional great powers that have not been as active in the region coming back in. You mentioned Russia, and I think you're absolutely correct, both in terms of the role in North Korea uh, increasing, but also, of course, the energy supply and the energy <coughs> agreement that's just been signed with Russia. Uh, and also India now, after its new election, one expects a much more confident and, uh, and consistent strategic orientation that's going to include the Far East more prominently than before. So the role of... Um, you know, six or seven major world powers in this region simultaneously does have the potential for there to therefore be some kind of a Cold War 2.0. I would only differ in that I see a lot of fluidity within those dynamics. For every action, there is a reaction. Uh, when we speak about America's pivot to Asia, at the same time, the <coughs> counter reaction becomes uh, how can ASEAN have a voice of its own? What is China going to do to potentially re engage with codes of conduct and calm the waters? When we talk about the American shale gas revolution, the ability mm. to export uh, cheap energy to reinforce relationships with Asian allies, then there is an effort, of course, to tie up with Russia, Australian production, uh, production of gas all around the region to bring down regional prices, and that would mitigate the growing leverage that the U.S. has. When we talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the idea of also embedding and strengthening alliance relationships, and this gets to the point about uh, ide ideology and economic competition, then <coughs> on the response is the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which would be an equally robust intra-regional trade zone. So we can never say definitively, by giving those examples of the shale gas and the trade agreement and the military pivot, you see that you can, you can make a forecast that lasts for six months or one year and say, oh, this is the new dynamic. But then things change on the ground and from within the region, and you have that restoration of, uh, of fluidity. So I, I, I wouldn't be so certain that we will be clear about the camps. What I would say, though, is that the, the form that this uh, ideological competition, if there is one, is going to take, and in a way what the competitive dynamics really are about, whether they seem to be 20th century territorial um, or about... Um, matters of technology and so forth, it really is about who controls the supply chains, right? Who controls uh, the, the value added, who controls the access corridors and so forth. And the, the insecurities that we ascribe to these traditional territorial mm -hmm. concerns and attitudes are really derivative of a concern for controlling supply chains of energy and technology and other uh, commodities. Parag, would you ag agree that we are seeing the end of the liberal order and the return of Westphalianism? A return of? Westphalian. 
uh, interesting. No, I actually think that that, that is a mistake. Uh, you know, and, and I think a, a, a more accurate analysis is that whereas even countries like China are considered very statist mm -hmm. and Westphalian in nature, uh, that how they view the sanctity of their own borders differs from how they view uh, the, the sanctity of others' oh, borders. Others. Okay. And therefore, they are not entirely Westphalian per se. Mm -hmm. And that's why looking at things <laughs> from the standpoint of it takes, it's a two-way street after all. Uh, it, that's why I think taking a sort of supply chain approach is very important. Mm. What uh, with the uh, CNOC 981 oil rig uh, off the Paracel Islands, the, the term that was used by the chairman of the, of the oil company was that this is part of our mobile national sovereignty. So there's very novel language being used that isn't quite captured by <laughs> Westphalian theory. Uh, Neo Westphalian, isn't it? Yeah, it, it wouldn't even. I don't. I don't think we should use the word Westphalian, okay. quite frankly, uh, in in this conversation. We should really be talking about uh, again these these supply chain nodes and what their implications are for what constitutes territory in the first place, and therefore what uh, what avenues or corridors for supply chains they want to control, and those. Uh, can't really be grounded in traditional Westphalian legal theory at all. So mm -hmm. we need to be much more, I think, uh, creative. Admiral, I'd like to move to you. Um, the, um, the pivot to Asia were basically announced, I think, more or less when you took over uh, Pacific Command. And um, of course, you are very central uh, to, to the whole uh, thinking of the US presence in the region. And, and I'd like to hear your strategic outlook seen from your uh, very important position uh, in the Pacific. Well, thank you. The, uh, as you know, uh, President Obama announced the, the pivot, which, or the rebalance to the Asia-Pacific. Uh, let me start by saying it's not uh, just about security, it's about our military security, it's about all of government, uh, all of humanity, all of the things that are important to the American people. And I think the, one of the main audiences for the, for the rebalance was the American people, uh, was to, con to once again reassure to them that we're a Pacific nation, uh, that our interest for this century and beyond will lie here in the Pacific, and that we have uh, historic alliances, growing partnerships. I mean, we have $1.2 trillion of two-way trade through this part of the world each year. Uh, so this matters to the American people, the security and stability of what happens in Asia. Uh, now, my role, though, is on the security side, on the military side. And I think that uh, the underlying assumption in a, in a global, growingly glo uh, productive global economy, and it really is quite amazing what's happened in my lifetime, our lifetimes, as far as globalization. Uh, just, just think about uh, the things that flow in the, in the maritime domain. Uh, today, about 90% of everything that moves in the world moves on the oceans. Uh, and that, and just in my lifetime, and as a career, that has quadrupled in volume. And it will continue to, to go up as we move energy and sources around and those types of things. So I think for, for, the, for that global economy to thrive <clears throat> in a very complex world that's growing with, with growing challenges, it has to be underwritten by a set of assumptions on what does that security environment mean. It's like, it's like your neighborhood at home. If you have a safe neighborhood, it's generally going to have a pretty good uh, draw for businesses and Definitely. families and good schools. Well, that's the true for the, the global economy, I think, as well, and in particular here in the Asia Pacific. But there are some significant challenges here. Uh, one, uh, you can't compare this to, uh, to Europe or to NATO. Uh, the that vastness of this region and the diversity of the cultures and the diversities of the histories here uh, across really what spans about half the world, I think to try to make that analogy too quickly is, uh, is not uh, productive. Uh, but there are challenges. First of all, it's just the mass of humanity here. Uh, today, there's about 7 billion people in the world. Six out of every 10 live here. In this century, they expect that to go to 9 billion. And seven out of every 10 people in the world will live here. And as food sources have to be rethought about because of climate change and because of changing weather patterns, those have to be considered. Uh, as more and more uh, of humanity move towards the oceans and to look for uh, econ economic viability. You see today in, in all industrializing countries are moving closer and closer to the maritime and littorals to get access to that economy, to those, ec those economic benefits. These start to, to put new dimensions on how we have to think through security. But of course there are those traditional security issues that seem to continue to plague us and probably will for some time. Uh, the situation in North Korea. Uh, the armistice was signed the year I was born. 
uh, and not much has changed in North Korea except that you have the third generation of a, of a radical regime that now uh, claims to have nuclear weapons that will, can hold the rest of the world at hostage. And so this is a very important problem that must be dealt with and considered because I believe that a disruption in, in the Korean Peninsula would have far-reaching implications for the security of the, the, the global economy. And then, of course, there's the rise of China that you mentioned. There's also the rise of in India and a growing importance of Indonesia in the economic framework of, of Asia Pacific. And certainly the great economic prosperity that's happening in, in countries even like the Philippines here today. And of course, then we've got the historic and traditional uh, territorial disputes that you see going on that are kind of tearing at the fabric of, of what we used to think was right, and now we're having to make some decisions about how we're going to, going to deal with it. The Asia Pacific region, because of its economic growth, is also the most militarized region in the world. This is where the military uh, navies, armies, uh, you pick a piece of it, is growing the most rapidly. The seven out of the ten largest armies in the world are in the Asia Pacific, Indo-Asia Pacific region. All the large navies in the world are here. And so these will, how, how these forces are managed to create a, a fabric of security that allows economic success here has not yet uh, been determined. Uh, you know, in the end, I think you're going to have a historical group of bilateral relationships, alliances, a growing number of trilaterals, and a need to move towards more multilateralism, as painful as it is sometimes, uh, to be able to ensure that you can create a security environment. I've described it as a patchwork quilt. You can't put, in this rural part of the world, you can't put a, a consistent uh, framework together like you can in a smaller, other, uh, more... Uh, homogeneous part of the world. It's going to be a, a number of, of, uh, of uh, economic uh, um, agreements, a number of alliances, a number of multilateral organizations, growing ones like ASEAN, who are going to have to have a voice in being able to, to hold the fabric of the security together. And what's going to underline that, the most important thing, is a, a commitment to rule of law, a commitment to international forums to solve problems, uh, to solve disputes. Uh, you can't have a, a winner-take-all attitude. It will require compromise. It will require dialogue, and it uh, it, it will require. And, it, and I guess the bottom line is, you will you will never stop having friction in this part of the world because a good economic growth, a good competition is is good for the region, and that springs competition, it springs friction. But we have to have a security environment that allows that friction to occur without tearing and then sending the region into uh, what, did you what you described might have been a century ago. Mm. Thank you very much, Admiral. Excellent points. So a couple of takeaways here. One is, of course, this region is particularly dynamic. It has a large population. Most of the people on the planet live here. It's a young population for, for many countries uh, part. It has a tremendous potential, but also the challenge that this potential will be undermined by security competition. The second takeaway, I think, is the, your reminder of the role of oceans for commerce and for you know, commerce and trade for, for con contact between people. And I would say, historically speaking, the role of navies has been more about protecting the sort of free lanes uh, of shipping uh, in order to promote pro commerce and actually see battles with other countries. So, so this is a continued uh, relevance of, of the job that uh, you and your colleagues uh, are doing. And um, I think also another takeaway uh, so far in the discussion is that while, while a more sort of European-centric or European North American-centric outlook on security for the last 20 years have been the assumption that we would go from classical competition between states to so-called new and asymmetric threats, I think this theater, this region, shows that there is a continued relevance of the classical security challenges where big states compete with each other. And that's probably more a dominant theme in the 21st century than we might have thought when we were in the midst of Afghanistan and Iraq and so on. Plus you're adding domains that domains. are becoming more and more critical. So in this case of cyber, I mean, to the, mm. you know, who would have thought 30 years ago that the cyber world would be so critical to the day-to-day -day operation of the global economy, including this part of the world? but it, yet it's the, one of the most ungoverned spaces we have, mm. and it's at risk. And that puts risk on economic development. So That's we right. have to have that dialogue, not just about oceans and airspace and land masses, but we have to have that dialogue about how do we operate in cyberspace. 
and then extrapolate that into space. This is one of the dialogues that the World Economic Forum is trying to drive and for <laughs> precisely those reasons. Uh, this is basically now sort of a, a quick tour of the security landscape, but let's now move towards the solutions part. What can we do about it? How can we, how can we move ahead? And I'd like to start by inviting uh, um, Secretary General uh, Ivatani uh, uh, on the Trilateral uh, Cooperation Secretariat. What mm -hmm. is your perspective focusing on what to do? Well, actually, uh, Admiral uh, put me in a rather difficult position <laughs> because I was going to propose the, to follow the example of Europe. Uh, um, in this region, uh, as Admiral just said, uh, uh, because of the diversify, uh, diversified culture, uh, culture and so forth, um, we, we are trying to uh, refrain from forcing uh, uh, Asian countries to accept one set of norm, uh, legal institution, and uh, try to be inclusive. Uh, and based on that assumption, there had been a lot of discussions uh, have taken place um, as to security issues, uh, military issues uh, also. Uh, my feeling is that it is about time that we should consider to establish a certain solid uh, legally based uh, uh, institutional framework uh, to talk about all these uh, political military issues. And uh, when we look at uh, a European example, the European Union is also, was of course, uh, much advanced uh, than, uh, than us. Uh, maybe we can take the example of OSCE. Uh, as I was posted in uh, Vienna uh, before I, I came to Seoul, uh, I watched, I observed uh, how they uh, function in order to, to create a, a, a trust among the member countries. Uh, they can meet uh, as often as they want, almost every day, mm. to talk about these issues. So this kind of uh, um, dialogue uh, forum uh, should be established in this region. Mm. And, uh, well, I, I think uh, this will be the extension of uh, ASEAN Regional Forum. Mm -hmm. They have been working on this uh, issue for the past uh, 20 years or so. And uh, this work should be expertized, expertized and uh, in order to do that, they need a more solid uh, institution uh, so that they can meet more frequently. Mm. Uh, so that is my idea. And uh, I belong to a Trilateral Cooperation uh, Secretariat. And eventual goal of a Trilateral Cooperation is to establish the East Asian community. It is stipulated in the Vision 2020 uh, of the Trilateral Cooperation. Uh, and definitely in this East Asian community, there should be uh, uh, security uh, issues uh, handled in, in this organization. And so we have to start preparation now. Thank you very much. And you would, st you, so, so the, your final goal is an East Asian security and economic political community, community, but you also suggest that you would build that on the ASEAN Regional Forum. Yes. Did I forget you right? Yes. When you make your, as a European, when you make the reference to the OECE, I, I confirm that we can meet frequently, but uh, it's still work in progress, as Ukraine has showed us. <laughs> we're, not really, we're not really done with uh, establishing yeah, yeah, yeah. trust in Europe, and actually I think the, the last uh, mo years have led to a reduction in strategic trust yes. between main players in Europe, rather than the increase. So, even if you have institutions, you may have problems. So just yes, want to yes, point yes. out that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I uh, recognize this uh, yeah. difficulty. Even in European Union, this uh, political military uh, side is still to be developed. They mm. are now formulating this uh, common security uh, policy, mm. but it is, it does not cover everything, right? It just part of it. And I think it's fair for, if you want, you know, to, to follow up on the historic analogy, uh, the European Union would probably not have happened if it wasn't for the U.S. security guarantee to Western Europe. Mm -hmm. so, so although the EU began as an economic political cooperation, it was under the umbrella of the U.S. nuclear uh, mm -hmm. and security guarantee. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, that's difficult to see that you will have kind of one driving force behind the unification of, uh, you know, a, a kind of a broader uh, political um, agreement between Japan and China uh, as things stand today. Question. <laughs> um, well, um, in order to establish the East Asian community, mm. uh, probably the key countries are this trilateral, you know, mm. Japan, China, and Korea. Um, it is a very challenging task to establish a collaborative relationship among the three countries, particularly in the area of uh, security. Mm. Uh, however, uh, without this collaborative relationship, I, I don't think we can establish a uh, very solid uh, organization uh, in this region. Um, so it will take time, but uh, we should make uh, efforts. Challenging, but on. even more necessary. Thank you. So, Under uh, Secretary del Rosario, let's move to ASEAN, uh, the host country and the host uh, region. I think one of the most promising developments in the world, as I see it, is you know the coming together of the Asian uh, ASEAN states, but also the way it's not only about the ten countries, but also about the broader region. And the ASEAN Plus is probably the closest you get to a regional integration process uh, in this part of the world. What can ASEAN do to? solve the challenges that we were discussing or at least mitigate them? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for ASEAN, of course, we do want to encourage the major actors not to engage in unilateral actions that will create a narrower space for cooperation. I think the more strident some countries might become, the harder it is to look for, for those, as I said, the space in which we can work together. And of course, Underlying our encouragement of this is we hope that all actors, including ourselves, should follow the norms of good behavior and a rules-based approach to everything that we do uh, from, I mean, following international law. Uh, added to this, of course, is that personally I believe that following rules or international law is the best confidence-building measure that one can have because we believe that, you know, transparency eventually will lead to good governance. And when there's good governance, everybody feels secure. On the ASEAN side, I think we need to study and re-examine and redefine what we mean by ASEAN centrality. More and more, I think people are beginning to see that there is tension now between the interests of ASEAN as a group and national interests. Mm. And if we cannot balance this, if we forget that paramount to our national interest also is, of course, the protection of their regional interest. Then we can easily be divided. We might divide ourselves, or we might not even be able to work cooperatively. And of course, on the on the other side is this: that I I believe that all of us in ASEAN we should try to form strategic partnerships with all the major actors. We have one with China. And I think we should have one with India as well, mm -hmm. as we should have one with the United States, and we should have one with Japan. Because in this case, I mean, as, uh, as we can see, then we will be able to, 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 you know, to, to form more or less a network of, you know, of, of, of alliances, and then we will not be, will not be <coughs> used uh, you know, to, to play, I mean, we will not be played against the other. And, and at the same time, I mean, for, for us in our own region, we should also look at the involvement of our citizenry. I think it's, it, you know, the f moving along in foreign policy is becoming more complicated when the citizens get involved. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened in China when they started to burn the Japanese factories and in Vietnam when they started to act against the factories of other countries, it does create some kind of... Um, what they call that, um, insecurity also, also for the investors. Mm. And unfortunately, of course, we are in this Asian paradox. As we grow economically, the tensions also grow. But I think if ASEAN will continue to take its role as, as, you know, as a central core force, in the same way that we created ASEAN, or we believe uh, that our I mean, ASEAN Regional Forum is also centered on ASEAN, the APEC also believe that uh, ASEAN is also the, the core group in APEC, it's the core group in EAS, then maybe we might be able to, to 
finally create a more stabilizing force in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you. And I think that there is a great expectation put on ASEAN from the outside uh, because everybody comes to ASEAN's meetings as the primary focus. I had the pleasure last year to take part in Brunei and you know John Kerry was there, the EU uh, security representative were there, the Chinese were there, the, everybody were, were, were there mm -hmm. and, and see this as a primary forum. But I think you point to a very important core challenge that you need to make ASEAN more known and supported among your own public. Because any integration process will have winners and losers. Yes. And you have to convince the losers up front that you know, there's a long-term gain, even if you give up some of your privileges, for instance, from protected markets and so on. Uh, and and I, I wonder, are you, are you doing that? Is that happening? Or uh, is it more something you would like to see happening? Oh, um, we, of course, I, I think there are also things here, that, like, like the, the principles that we're trying to follow. Like um, Mr. Kano mentioned, RCEP. Okay, for us, that's one way, of course, of integrating the region through our ASEAN Plus One economic partnerships. Mm -hmm. And our, uh, I mean, it involves our R the RCEP involves all the major players, including the European Union. Eventually, when we, you know, the FTA with the European Union. But but as I have mentioned, if we cannot somehow get a strong hold on the ASEAN regional interest versus our national interest, then we might always be, you know, getting into the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the tension among ourselves because we, it cannot be avoided. ASEAN members themselves also compete with one another for mm -hmm. investments. And I think that's also something that nobody can deny. And, and at the same time also, we also know that if there's a weak link in one of us, it might also discourage the investors to come to the region. More specifically on security, just to follow up on ASEAN, one question. I think since 2010, I believe, there's been a defense minister's meeting in the ASEAN framework, initiated, by, interestingly enough, by the Vietnamese mm -hmm. chairmanship. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and there's also discussions on the code of conduct, where for the South China Sea, which I personally find is very interesting. Yeah. But could you just update us on what these um, discussions are going? Unfortunately, we haven't really started negotiations on the code of conduct. Mm. We do have the declaration on, on the code and, and declaration on, on how we should behave in this in the South China Sea. And it, of course, it means we should not do any unilateral action that will, you know, destroy the status quo or the balance. And that, of course, we should always pursue peaceful settlement of disputes. But the code of conduct, <coughs> it's. Mm, it has been long in coming. I mean, we've been discussing about this, I think, for the past seven or eight years. Yeah. And we're also wondering, why is there a delay? Because are we changing the environment so that when we're ready to discuss the code of conduct, the environment has changed. Mm. I mean, we are not acting fast enough. And there's so many changes happening now. So eventually, when we discuss the COC, as we call it, from what point are we going to discuss it? Because when we started talking about it, the changes now were not yet there. Now there's so many changes already. Talking about movements, you know, on on the claims especially, and there are a lot of a lot of build ups, a lot of construction going on until we realize uh, are people already doing some kind of a fencing around already about what they're going to define as the baseline for the code of conduct. I think it's quite urgent because there is a significant military <coughs> presence from many yes, countries yes. now in the South China yeah. Sea in places of high where mm -hmm. there's a lot of disputes. I mean, and, uh, yeah. and I think it's quite familiar for multilateral institutions that you, tr you start solving a problem and then the problem changes. You keep solving yes, the, old, the right. old problem. Yes, that, yeah. that's, why, <coughs> that's why we've been wanting to start the discussion in the Code of Conduct. Because once the parameters have changed or once the baselines will have changed, then I think that will influence the code of conduct. Admiral, do you think a code of conduct would be helpful if it came into? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think first of all, the role of ASEAN in uh, basically this is your neighborhood. Uh, so the role of ASEAN in being able to manage neighborhood friction or neighborhood disputes, either at the economic, social, or military level, I think is really quite important. And they have made some progress. Uh, the code of conduct, however, if you if you take a look at the the competing claims that uh, are just in the South China Sea alone. I have to ask myself, why now? Why, why has this come, come in, this, uh, in this decade and why wasn't it in previous times? Probably has always been lingering for, for some time, but 
They waited for you to take over command. Well, uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, but but my, you know, my per personal observation is, is that it, it, we're dealing with it now for several reasons. One is the, is the rapid um, in, um, in, uh, economic growth of the region, mm. uh, the rapid rise of China, uh, the rapid uh, need to access resources. And then we, in the uh, 80s, uh, the <coughs> UN Law of the Sea Convention, and other mechanisms laid out how you then describe your economic zones and who would own what fish and who would control what uh, seabed resources. Uh, and so once that happened, then there was a desire for uh, independent nations to start defining what their uh, access and what their uh, economic zones look like. So when you lay all these together, uh, it's very complicated. I mean, the, the chart of who owns what in the yeah. South China Sea, very, very complicated. And then you add what I believe is a rather ambiguous uh, perspective from China of the nine-dash line that has been challenged. Um, over the top of it, this just makes it hard. So over time, as things change, uh, to, to, re to deal with a hard problem, you have to baseline somewhere. And the U.S. position has been that you, we need to baseline it, yeah. uh, that we need to, to maintain status quo, which was in the DOC, uh, and not to move forward from that until there's been uh, a legal ability to look at this. And it's happening in other, between other parts of the world where these, these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, are being, uh, the tribunals are, ma are making decisions and are being ab abided by. But the code of conduct should have been here uh, several years ago, and they're not uh, appear to be not any yeah. closer to it today. And underneath it, the status quo is changing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Could yeah. could such a kind of um, a liberal order type of regime of behavior, like a code of conduct, could actually tr that trump the uh, state interests, and uh, would it be successful given it, the landscape you described? It wouldn't be enough. And I think the code of conduct. I think the admiral is absolutely correct. You needed to have the code of conduct prior, and there have been conversations about such codes of, codes of conduct actually since the 1990s Spratly Island disputes, which were sort of a, a precursor to what's happening today, but, but now in retrospect a lot smaller. I worry a lot about a uh, conversation in which we are focused so much on uh, institutions, but without the strategic maturity to back them. You have layers and layers already. If you look at an institutional map of Asia, it does resemble the European Union already. But quite frankly, they have moved from multilateralism towards supranationalism in a wide range of functional areas. And that obviously has not happened here. But the stakes here are, uh, as we know, uh, even higher than they were a century ago. Mm in that part of the world. So I worry a lot that just talking about ASEAN, ASEAN plus three, ASEAN economic community, ASEAN regional forum, East Asian community. Uh, when Kevin Rudd was Prime Minister of Australia, he talked about the, the Asian Union. You can talk about these institutions and you can talk about codes of conduct, but you have to have the strategic maturity to, to back them. And I'm worried that in the, given the, the fact that there are daily flashpoints in this region, you needed to have the code of conduct yesterday. You need to have proactive, you know, resource sharing kinds of agreements in, in place already or be, be executing and practicing them now rather than waiting for the dialogue uh, uh, to emerge. And, and what disappoints me about this lack of strategic maturity is that there are examples going back a century in how to deal with these kinds of disputes. Your country, Norway, had a dispute with Russia over Svalbard Island in the Arctic Sea uh, at the, towards the end of World War I. And you had a solution in terms of demilitarizing the island and mm. allowing any commercial entity to uh, exploit those resources. Uh, and the, even Saudi Arabia and Kuwait uh, and, and other sets of countries that have disputed maritime sort of assets have been able to find ways yeah. to go about this. So if Asia wants to be seen as a mature region, as that sort of third pillar of the world, a stable pillar of the world economy alongside North America and Europe and so on, it, it, it has to start doing these things already. And how do we get there? Well, I mean, I, I think that, again, these dialogues are fine. I, I prefer more novel solutions in which uh, if you, of course, you have to have some de-escalation initially from the military standpoint. But I think the national oil company should be involved in a, in a collective uh, sort of new vehicle, call it a special purpose vehicle mm -hmm. of some kind, in which they're jointly determining, uh, you know, which assets are exploited, which oil companies are involved, uh, or gas companies, uh, how the revenues are mm -hmm. shared, perhaps listing such a company on an exchange, something like that. So a commercial approach that 
gets around the nine dash line sort of sort of issue because when it when the national pride and, and sovereignty and these maps are at stake, it's incredibly difficult to have a kind of sort of compromise. But if you take a shared commercial approach in which everyone starts to mm. uh, enjoy the benefits in the short term, based on the need for, the demand for, the Admiral is right. We didn't have these uh, disputes decades ago because the economies weren't growing as much. There wasn't the need to, ex to harness uh, those raw materials as urgently as now. Well, if it is urgent, then they, in fact now mm -hmm. is the time to collaborate on that and bring, of course, the best technology uh, to, to the scene, uh, the best management, and so that everyone can benefit <coughs> from it. And I think what you just said is also an important call for the audience here because there are a lot of business people in the audience and I think as a general rule business people don't like conflicts they want right. cooperation Absolutely. it's much better for business and it's good for the people yeah. so so uh, so I think you know to take some responsibility actually demanding oh, solutions uh, is part of your recommendation mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. Rudiger uh, any yeah. comment on uh, this well I mean I, I think we shouldn't so quickly discard Europe as an example of course I'm aware of all those differences and I would never really go as far as comparing Europe and the EU with uh, East Asia or uh, ASEAN for that matter. But uh, I do believe that we have uh, achieved a few things in Europe and that we can even take some historical lessons. Just think about it. I, I heard a lot about uh, the reasons for uh, economic reasons for cooperation in Europe. But let's not forget that um, European integration started as a security yeah. alliance, especially uh, mitigating that conflict between Germany and France that has created so many problems in European security for, I would say, centuries. And this is now over. And uh, for East Asia, I would, for example, think about South Korea, Japan. Um, another complicated bilateral relationship between countries that should be cooperating. And they are, but they could do much better. And uh, this would be a nucleus around which something else could emerge. And I've always seen that uh, uh, possibility of, of course, cooperating with ASEAN. What I like about ASEAN and the EU, and I think this is why, despite all difficulties, that's why they exist in the first place, they have been so successful, is that they do not include one power that is too strong. And mm -hmm. even, you know, if, if you look at the sequencing of European integration, the EU as such, including the Euro and all those things, came into being after German unification, clearly with the strategic goal of taming that potential re-emerging giant of Germany and it worked. Of course it worked because Germany wanted to cooperate and it worked because Germany is not a country of 1 billion people or 200 million, it's just 80 million. So that kind of works in Europe. I don't think we could form uh, a stable um, regional integration body in East Asia that would include either the US or China. I think you, you mentioned the word strategic <coughs> partnership. I think this is what we should be looking for. Forming an organization of small and medium-sized states that then, as an organization, as an alliance, as however you call it, develop a very close, stable, peaceful, cooperative partnership with those powers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will open up in a second for the floor because there are a lot of people who like to ask questions. But just before we do that, uh, Mr. Rivatani, since uh, mm -hmm. as a Japanese living in Seoul, you, and given your job, you probably have some views on uh, Korean-Japanese relations as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's too difficult for me to <laughs> talk about. Um, as to uh, this uh, code of conduct, uh, that uh, reminds me of the effort made when they established OSCE. Uh, they adopted uh, 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 Stockholm uh, final mm. documents, final act. Uh, it took them, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 20 years to agree on this uh, uh, document and uh, it stipulates um, about 10 mm. uh, principles that these uh, members of the CSCE should uh, observe. So um, th this code of conduct is also, I think, uh, very, very difficult to agree on. Uh, but uh, instead of just focusing on this South China Sea, we should look at uh, the bigger picture and maybe more countries can join and talk about uh, these basic principles, code of conduct. Mm. Um, in this region, uh, countries only talk about international law. Uh, we should follow, based on the international law, we should solve the problems. It is, of course, it's true. If you look at the content of the international law, maybe uh, countries are 
have some you know, different idea as what is the international law. So we should have more uh, uh, principles uh, which is more concrete than just international law. Thank you. So uh, we've set the scene, uh, a challenging security situation, but also a number of attempts to deal with it, uh, embryonic, but still moving. Uh, so we open up for questions from the floor, and uh, any question is welcome, but short, crisp, provocative, and challenging questions are particularly welcome. So who has a provocative question, please? And please introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Amina Rasul from the Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy, and for once, I'm glad that there's another global security issue that takes attention away from Muslims. So, <laughs> but the, 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 um, what I wanted to, to say, um, I've been in government most of my life, so I understand that when groups like this gather, they look at the, the policy formulation. But you forget that when people are uh, embroiled. Uh, yesterday we were watching the, the television and it showed, for instance, the harvesting of giant clams, the uh, rioting that's, that's going on in, uh, in Vietnam. And in China, we've seen broadcasts that's really intended to make the blood boil wow. of the Chinese citizens. Perhaps you should be looking at the impact of certain strategies of governments on peoples. Because whereas it's very easy for states to change policy, once you've gotten peoples to rise up, it's very difficult to pacify that. And then you would have started a round of violence and enmity that will destroy any attempt at establishing uh, cooperation mm. when the security uh, confrontation moves on to another, uh, another issue. A very valid point, and I think, uh, Under Secretary Del Rosario, you did mention yes. the challenge of yes. nationalism. Yeah, and the involvement of the citizens. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, do you have a comment on this? Uh, actually, uh, that's something which my own government, I think, has been very conscious of. Uh, um, President Aquino, for instance, issued a statement you know, encouraging Filipinos, or rather discouraging them, you know, from doing something that might even add to, to, to tension. Because we saw the, the effects in, in Ho Chi Minh. Mm. We also saw the effects in, in Beijing at one point, I think, when they were acting against the Japanese. But uh, I think that's where we think that the media can play a role. Sometimes the media also, of course, should also be able to understand the issues and we, sometimes I wonder, I mean, how, how much should they report and how should they report it so that at least they're also adding to the, what they call that, to, to a better understanding of, and how they can promote also their own way of helping uh, create a better picture of the situation. Yeah, but I think the argument here is that governments have the responsibility to avoid, yeah. to incite, so as a, at the least thing they can do is not themselves to yes. incite violence. Yes. And secondly is, of course, uh, you know, to avoid that others do it as well. Yeah, yeah I, I think we all, it's a very valid point. Yes, please, Eric. Eric Belfrage from Sweden. Eric Belfrage from Sweden. Um, Admiral, when do you think that the United States will ratify the law of the sea treaty? <laughs> you knew it was coming. I knew that was coming. <laughs> Uh, I don't know uh, that I can give you a date on when our Senate will act favorably on, on ratification. Uh, as you have probably read, uh, it's been my position, the position of all the senior military leaders in the United States, uh, the position of the, this current administration uh, to press forward with ratification. Uh, let me caveat it and say that from the security perspective, we are bound to abide by it. So from where I sit, we de facto uh, support the security aspects of that. Um, but I can't give you a date. I would hope it would be soon. Yeah, it, it shows the power of the people in a sense because the whole elite in the US wants this to happen and it's not happening. But I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very important point that the US is actually abiding by the rules. So it's, it's not, by not signing, you're not able to claim your rights, but you can respect the rights of others, which you do. So, I mean, that's, that's the current US position. Question over here. Uh, morning, I'm Raman Narayanan from Air Asia. I'm from the private sector, and obviously I'm not the same pay grade as the panelists, all of you in this room. I'm just a simple salaryman working at a low-cost airline. 
but from the private sector perspective, <laughs> we started this, this discussion about are we seeing the emergence of Cold War 2.0? Mm. The Cold War, original Cold War, major component, of course, was the ideological aspect of left wing, right wing. In my line of business, I'm only fully aware that we need two wings to fly. <laughs> and to go on from that, uh, the issue of uh, South China Sea, I, I wonder if uh, Under Secretary can explain a bit more, and I also just to follow on from Admiral Lockley's comment of there's no winner take all solution in these kind of issues. Uh, if there's something from within ASEAN's own history that can make ASEAN more assertive in contributing to how we resolve this issue in line with our notion of ASEAN centrality, I'm thinking about back in the 1970s when Malaysia and Thailand were engaged in a tit for tat over control of resources at the Isthmus of Kra. And let's face it, the whole South China Sea issue is not a nationalistic kind of issue. It's about resource control and accessibility to resources. At least that's how I perceive it from my level. And I wonder if the solution we used in, in how we, Malaysia and Thailand sorted out that issue. Essentially, it was discussions that led to a formula that was summed up in a single line. Let's all drink from the same well. So I wonder if that sort of perspective, ASEAN can do more to emphasize that sort of approach, that sort of perspective, and then actively work within the structures that are available that everybody adopts that same approach. And just one passing comment about governments and nationalism. From our perspective, you know, despite all these headlines that you see, business goes on. Back in the 70s, 80s, it was China, Taiwan. Well, Taiwan is now what, the biggest foreign investor in mainland China. Business goes on. Coup, that's not a coup, that's now a coup in Thailand. Well, all I can tell you is that from our perspective, bookings to Bangkok are up on Asia. So business goes on. Into or out of? <laughs> <laughs> Both ways. <laughs> Both ways. We make money each way. <laughs> Which, you know, sometimes we just wish, you know, governments and all these leaders involved in all these issues, why don't they just go to some isolated island, throw stones at each other, <laughs> and leave us all alone to go on with our daily lives and make more money? That's a good one. That a strong support in the audience. Other questions? A question here? We will collect uh, a couple of questions. Thank you, and, and I appreciate your point, Parakana, but... Uh, I appreciate Parak's point about the uh, possibility of joint development. But we in Indonesia, we've been trying to get uh, claiming parties to agree to joint development on any resources. And after almost 15 years, uh, we felt we found that all the claimants talk about joint development, but when it comes down to it, they don't want to do it because no one is ready to put aside uh, the jurisdictional uh, issues. Um, so maybe I can follow up with question to this uh, undersecretary. Uh, does, uh, when the Philippines talk about their development, how, how, how serious is it? And, and if, if, uh, do you think joint development of oil is possible? And if so, with which claimants yeah. would that be possible? Yeah, I, I think the, the issue here is when they talk about joint development, I think some people are, remember what China has said, that they do want joint development. So it's, it's, it's becoming like uh, China and another country. So it's China plus one. And, and what we were thinking of is, if it's just China plus one or one plus one, who will, who will decide you know, the kind of equitable distribution? It can be complicated because, uh, like, like in our case also, when we go into our own um, joint venture, we're guided also by the rule on how much should be given to the other side. Uh, and you're right in that sense. Unless, of course, they're thinking of joint development as you know, a communal kind of thing. But that's something that has to be explained to the people themselves. And, and as you said, people are thinking of sovereignty. Now, going to the Chinese, for instance, the Chinese students have been taught from childhood that the whole of the South China Sea is theirs. So I mean, for them, it's a harder thing. They also have to deal with their own domestic problems. They have to deal with their own citizens. Now, for us, people ask us, why did you have to go to the arbitration court? It's not a matter of us going against China, but rather trying to gain some clarity on, on maritime entitlements of the claimants. We hope that by bringing our case to the it laws, or rather to the court for arbitration, we'll be able to, to get a definition 
on what is what can we claim as ours and hopefully this will also reverberate and will trickle down to the other claimant countries and for us that's one way really of settling the matter in a more peaceful way mm. giving legal clarity i think one of the key questions is is this a set of bilateral relations or is it a more general multilateral issue and obviously a great power like china would prefer yes. bilateral solutions that, and right. smaller countries would probably be for yes, that's multilateral right. that's solutions. Other thing yeah. too. We want to, to deal with the issue as ASEAN, as a group, mm. rather than on one arm, because considering that the other side is big. But, but again, we have to have some clarity on the maritime entitlements. We have to also get some clarity on the nine dash line. As the Admiral said, it's not defined, you know, there's no coordinates. We don't know how far it can go and how, you know, how wide it can be. Uh, uh, yeah, one question from Behind here, I don't know. over there first. Mm. Okay. Next. I'm Trevor Moss with the Wall Street Journal. Um, I'd just like to ask uh, the uh, Admiral Locklear a question. Uh, one of the panel mentioned that it's important that we avoid forming blocks of opposing countries in the region. Um, but through the pivot to Asia, isn't the US essentially doing that by? Um, um, encouraging anti-Chinese uh, countries, or, or maybe not anti-Chinese, but countries that are concerned about China's rise, um, to form a block with the U.S. Um, through the, the new defense pact with the Philippines, for example, doing more with Japan um, and even Vietnam. It, is the U.S. essentially forming just the kind of block that, that one of the panelists warned against? Yeah, well, that's a great question. The, uh, <clears throat> of course, let's remember the U.S. has been in the Asia Pacific for 70 years. And has, and has generally underwritten the security of Asia Pacific for 70 years uh, through allies, partnerships, presence, things that we've done here. It's helped our economy, helped the global economy, and I would say it's helped China, it's helped everybody else in this region as well. So as we enter into this century and you have a, uh, a rising China that has, uh, for, for whatever reason, uh, with historical reasons, has kind of coming into a mature, fairly mature security environment late in the game and may not necessarily be happy with the, with the uh, rule sets that, that it is coming into. Um, so the U.S. position, the U.S. military position is to welcome China into the security environment as a, as a productive partner. I mean, th look at it from a U.S.-China economic perspective. I mean, we share so, so many interests. I mean, I tell my counterparts, you know, there's probably about 80 percent of the things that we deal with each day where the U.S. and China converge on, mm. and we have to because it's important for everybody that we do, and we work hard to keep that convergent. And then there's a part of it that we diverge on, uh, but it's a lesser subset of that. And many of that divergence happens to be in this part of the world where, uh, where uh, that that China would consider, I think, is their kind of their backyard. Um, so I, I will say again uh, that. The, the U.S. position out here is not to contain China. Militarily, we welcome them in. We welcome more transparency. We welcome more exercises. We have Chinese, as of today, come into Realm of the Pacific exercises next month, historic, where they'll participate with 23 nations. So we're working the, these types of things. But in my opinion, the, uh, the only person that can contain China is China. And it's the decisions that China makes about what they do in their neighborhood here. Mm. And... Uh, you can, you can have your own opinion about whether that's happening or not. Before we go to the next question, I'd like I'll just quick comment on add that. I think the Admiral's been very uh, sort of you know, diplomatic in, in, in uh, pointing out <laughs> that uh, you know, the, the, I, I've had my own concerns about the original formulation of the pivot and the rebalancing. It was accused of being vague and thus susceptible to interpretations that, that, uh, lend, that, that go in the direction of Cold War 2.0. But I think he and other uh, U.S. officials have been very, very clear about the fact that, that you know, having a strategic presence in the region is A, not something right. new, and B, creating the conditions of strategic balance is an opportunity for Asian indigenous nations to develop their own institutions and stability, um, and the U.S. is there simply to support that and not to take sides. And I think day after day, week after week, American officials have been very, very clear about that. And that does bring us back to the sort of, uh, you know, post uh, or the cold, cold, early Cold War European history. If we want to draw lessons, it's really uh, from NATO, even though it's a completely different sort of uh, um, you know historical period and geography. But it's that you know the U.S. presence in the Netherlands creates the conditions for something like the European Union yep. to emerge, and that really is going to be up to um, 
you know, to all of the players in the room. And I'm glad that you mentioned earlier not just the uh, uh, the governmental, but also the the corporate. I mean, to the gentleman from Air Asia, I think Air Asia has done as much or more uh, for unity, culturally, commercially, and otherwise, in Asia than any uh, than uh, any ASEAN treaty has. <laughs> Next question is here. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Good morning, Mabuhai. Uh, my name is Amtiaz Mukpur from Travel Impact News in Bangkok. Uh, my question is for the Admiral. Um, can I just take you away from naval security to aviation security, Admiral, and ask you what the military, the U.S. military knows about what actually happened to MH370? <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people find it very difficult to believe that with all your satellites around you, nobody knows what happened. Well, I think they'll have to believe uh, that it was a worldwide <laughs> effort. Uh, it, it, we took, um, um, you know, after the initial assessment of what happened uh, in coordination with the Malaysians and then in partnership with the Australians, um, almost every country in the world came together to bring the most sophisticated capabilities that we had to bear uh, to be able to determine uh, what um, the circumstances might have been around what happened to that that around that tragedy. And uh, I think it points out to the world that, uh, that, that it is, we're still a pretty large world and there's still some areas of the world, particularly our oceans, which are vast, uh, which are many of them remain uh, uncharted. Uh, and that we, when we do bring even our most sophisticated capabilities together, we're not always successful. Uh, it doesn't mean we won't find that airplane at some point in time. I believe the world will be committed to finding that airplane. It will happen at some point in time. And there'll be some resources continue to be dedicated to it. You've seen that play out in, in the media. Uh, but um, I, I uh, watched this uh, very carefully. And I, and I can tell you, I think that just about everything that could have been done has been done. And we just haven't found it yet. Thank you. The floor is open if anybody else has a question. Otherwise, I have one. We had, uh, so yesterday, one question on institutional development. Uh, uh, we have, yesterday we had the vice, vice president of Myanmar and a big delegation. That's a country we're celebrating a very positive development towards democracy, kind of a, a controlled transition into a much more open society. That's great news for the country, but also I think for ASEAN. But then just to learn that yesterday there was a military coup uh, in Thailand. It's the second biggest economy of ASEAN. It's a quite significant uh, dramatic event. Um, some perspective on what that means to ASEAN integration, that you suddenly have a military coup in the midst of a yes, democratic and development. And I, I think I, I forgot to mention that in my initial um, mm. discussion. I think we really have to strengthen the institutions in, AS in ASEAN. For instance, the, the, the democratic institutions. Are we, we say that we believe in democracy, the core values of freedom, market forces, and all that. And yet, at the same time, there are forces within our own individual you know, countries that seem to shake and those, that seem that seems to shape those institutions. I think we do need to strengthen them, you know, not, not just the government institutions, but even even the, the civil society, NGOs, and even maybe the strategic thinkers, because only then can we really become a, a, a strong, strong group. And even when it comes to, you know, in integration, even within our own individual countries, we just talk about Myanmar with all the ethnic groups there. You know, they're having a difficult time integrating themselves. And sometimes you are wondering, how can we even integrate ourselves as 10 nations? So within ourselves, mm. we're also having the challenges of integrating ourselves within ourselves. So it's really a big challenge. And I think we, need, we have to continue working on this, on the social, political, and you know, the people-to-people -people kind of relations. I think, again, to this Europe reference, uh, one of the great achievements in Europe is that it has become easier to be a Catalan or a Basque or a Scot or a, or a Breton after the establishment of the European Union because sort of a broader unity sort of took away some of the drama between the nation state and the, yeah. and the subgroup. So, I mean, that's something maybe as, uh, you know, ASEAN integration could make uh, borders less relevant and hence uh, people yeah. uh, of diverse ethnic uh, backgrounds can I, I live better together. I think that's together. really what we're hoping for when we're talking about the social social what, cultural integration mm. yeah but but you know living in the philippines i mean i can speak for ourselves because we're the one farthest away from from all the asean i think if you if people have to grade us i think filipinos are not as as much as conscious as the other asean countries about the asean identity mm. and it's because maybe for one thing even about talking about you know integrating ourselves we are an archipelago made up of many islands. So if we have to think of ourselves, 
we have to think of ourselves, you know, as a, as a group of islands as the Philippines. And then we have to think of another entity which is so far away from us. So, so in that sense too, we are not as conscious of our ASEAN identity mm -hmm. as the other ASEAN countries are. Uh, uh, um, again, about um, coming back to Europe, uh, Professor um, Frank mentioned um, the reconciliation between um, that happened first between Germany and France. My question, but this was done by leaders, by people. So is there a leader in this mm -hmm. region, or one, or two, who could come up and, and do the same thing that Helmut Schmidt, Giscard d'Estaing, and later on Helmut Kohl and, and Mitterrand did for um, Europe? Excellent question. Where is Helmut Schmidt in this, <laughs> <laughs> in Asia? Jean Monnet, Helmut Jean Monnet, Schmidt, yeah. Yeah. Jacques Delors. Yeah. I mean, the silence is uh, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah. Any proposals from? Uh, <laughs> I think. I mean, I, I think it's a very valid point because, and particularly in ASEAN, because the you have collectively decided not to give the Secretariat a very prominent role. There's no commission. Mm. You know, and the, the European solution was basically to tell mm. a commission that you have extraordinary powers to run on certain air, coal, and steel community, yeah. and so yes. on. Now, I think for very understandable reasons, given a very different history, there is no desire in ASEAN to give the Secretary General that kind of driving force. But then you need somebody else. And, and who? Uh, in the past, we always... President Aquino, of course. <laughs> in the past, we always considered Indonesia as the mm. center of gravity of ASEAN. Mm. But, but, but when in, there was a time when they called the lost decade of Indonesia, and Indonesia was so, not so much engaged in ASEAN. <coughs> And we began to think, was that the point when ASEAN became to be, you know, to become weak? When, when the Indonesian leadership that you were looking at was not there because they had their own internal problems. Now, maybe it doesn't have to be Indonesia as the center of gravity. Maybe there, there could be somebody from any of these countries who mm. come out and say, no, let's start thinking ASEAN instead of just thinking of ourselves as 10 individual countries who happen to be a member of ASEAN. But if that person or country emerged, would the others tolerate that leadership? Maybe if there is, um, as I said, if there is transparency in that mm. person, and if there's also a transparency in the direction of the nation, that they don't see it as some kind of, a, you know, trying to, to be the, you know, the new bully in the group. Mm. So I think it can happen. The yeah. benign uh, leadership. Yeah. Of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. But, on that, Secretary, for us in Indonesia, I think we've always accepted that Indonesia does not have to be the natural leader of ASEAN. There are different issues yes. whereby different countries can take the lead, and we've always taken yes. that the yes. principle of collective leadership. For yes, ASEAN. But, but at one point we did consider Indonesia because it's the biggest in terms of size, it's the biggest in terms of population. And of course, at the time, it was really a, a regional giant. But okay, I don't want to say anymore because I'm going to say yes. Okay. But I mean, I, I see, I, I'll come to you, but I mean, it's interesting because in a sense, um, it sounds like there is a kind of desire for a leader, yes. but then the most no logical leader does not want to lead. Not on every No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a la carte. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you want to raise a question of, uh, given the era we are living in, of hyperconnectivity and mobility, access to mobility, whether you really you need any more such national kind of leader, one person at the top, man or woman. Maybe the fact is that these kind of things are happening at the ground level. Our citizens in ASEAN are texting each other, emailing each other, mm. thanks to Asia, flying and seeing each mm. other <laughs> <laughs> at, at a very low fare. <laughs> uh, but, but I'm seeing it's happening on the ground. I mean, I think the most regional leadership in ASEAN is coming not from government, it's coming from civil society. Mm. Because they deal with transnational issues. So they have to adopt a regional mindset. It's coming from the private sector. Because of investment, because you know, everybody wants to make money. So I, I'm not so sure that we need to look at leaders from government anymore. Mm. And I think there's a natural organic process already happening of integration at the ground level, which governments are not seeing because they're, they're so elitist, they deal with each other all the time sitting in rooms in five-star hotels. They're not on the ground out there. So I, I would say it's already happening. 
Parag. I think there, I, we all want to agree with that and we all do at some level, but there, there are problems with that. So if you take uh, major cross-border infrastructure projects, uh, of which you know, there, there's many on the drawing boards, high-speed rail connections from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur to Bangkok to Kunming. However, where is the private investment in infrastructure? It's incredibly low. It depends on the government. Every bank in ASEAN wants to have the pan-ASEAN banking license. Well, that's not going to happen without the government approval. Uh, data sharing agreements aren't going to happen without agreement on certain standards and protocols. The governments have to do these things. The private sector uh, is waiting uh, on the margins in a way for those things to happen. You, so it's, an, it's a plea to be much more active in the diplomacy to get those bottlenecks out of your way because you're correct that once they are, you can achieve a lot, but there are still certain things where the governments matter. Well, what about the NASEAN? You can go back to what I said earlier. Get governments out of the way and let us just go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think, I, I think Parag's answer to you I'm is... I'm being facetious, of course. What about an ASEAN Business Council that kind of demands specific <laughs> answers from politicians, you know, deliberalization? Well, well to be frank with you, the current existing business entities accredited to the ASEAN Secretariat are dormant. They are mainly headed by people from the old days, people from, mainly from Sunset Industries. Mm. There's a new generation of ASEAN entrepreneurs today who are looking at very different things. Some of them are the scions of the old families, but the kind of businesses they are into are not the sunset businesses, not the extractive industries kind of thing. They but you're, you're all here, so finance. go fix it, right? Yeah, they are, they are into the 21st century. Mm. Telecommunications, mo you know, mobile phones. The number of small-scale 21st century businesses that are being started up in ASEAN is amazing, but nobody pays attention to them. Because there's, there's no body where they can get together and talk about what they're doing or anybody pays attention. Yeah. Okay. We, we're on Swiss time. Uh, we're uh, exactly five minutes left. That's one minute for each uh, speaker. Is there one person who tried to get the floor but didn't? No, I can't see. And then, so we go. Let's really go first. We got one round. That will be your comment and your final word as well. Okay. But it's perhaps a bit too heavy for final words, but there's one topic that we really didn't talk about at all, and I don't think we can close that session without doing it, and this is Russia. For some strange reason, um, the Soviet Union was obvious to everybody, then it imploded. And uh, for the last 20 years, Russia has been mm. almost ignored, which I think is a big mistake. Mm. Now, as a European, we have those events in Ukraine, they're very un unfortunate. Don't think they are managed properly, but at least it made, made it more obvious that Russia obviously is back on the world stage and they want to be back. They have their own version of a pivot to Asia. Russia is, if you look at the map, an Asian country. And I think no strategic outlook on East Asia would be complete without considering Russia, without considering perhaps uh, what we as the West are doing in pushing Russia mm. towards a cooperation with China that they perhaps don't even want, and what that means for the overall situation. So back to my strategic, more general outlook, that's also a topic that we should be concerned about, and we should in integrate Russia into whatever is happening. And uh, as a baseline, I think uh, the progress of uh, institution building in ASEAN should simply continue. Mm. Uh, strategic partnerships should be built and mm. strengthened, and this is, I think, the way forward. Mm. Thank you very much. Under Secretary. I actually want to say the same thing. We really have to, and um, we're really serious about having to build strategic partnerships, and we really have to strengthen our institutions. I think those are the key. And of course, the third thing, if we have to think about the future, I think we also have to strengthen our educational mm -hmm. systems. Because mm. if we have a more educated population in ASEAN, I think we, you know, we, cannot, we cannot go wrong there. And that's something we are not so focused on, you know, the education of our people. Mm. I, I get the sense that um, the, the economy is, in a sense, moving too fast yes. for the institutions. They're not really that's able right. to develop right. in and line. Even our yeah. educational systems mm. should to be able to move as quickly as, mm. you know, as, the, as the changes that, that business and economics bring. Thank you. Admiral, uh, could you also comment on the Russia-China issue? It would be interesting to hear your view. Well, certainly the, uh, the, the recent changes uh, or recent issues with Russia, I think, give us should give us some concern here in the Asia-Pacific Asia as well. Uh, I think uh, uh, whether uh, Russia has the resources to become a significant Asian power, I think, uh, is yet to be determined, particularly from the military side, uh, because they had uh, retreated uh, a long ways uh, was, uh, when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. Uh, but it's certainly something that has to be thought about, and we have to in ensure that uh, uh, 
once the, uh, the world stabilizes from the re most recent issues in Ukraine, uh, that we have a uh, thoughtful uh, ASEAN, all the nations of Asia, the United States, China, they all have a thoughtful approach to how we will, we will uh, uh, continue to bring uh, Russia into the, into the international community, into the security environment. Um, let me uh, just go back a little bit to one, to one uh, line that, uh, that you well made, which was uh, uh, business goes on. And, and I think that if you talk to any military leader across any nation in Asia, even, the, even the, in the PLA, uh, they would say that's the ultimate objective is for business to go on. Uh, now, determine which direction business goes, sometimes we're at odds about that. Uh, but I would uh, say that for business to go on, uh, there has to be this underlying security architecture of some mm. kind, mm. and that has to be worked pretty hard. And I would, I would cautious all, all of, everyone to, to, to not, to, to, I'd cautious that we need to spend more time looking at what is happening in the military side of things in Asia. The rapid growth of militaries, the rapid growth of military equipment, much of it offensive in nature, um, you know, uh, if just leaving everybody alone and do business, that's fine. But at some point in time, uh, history would tell us if those are, are improperly used, that will destroy that security fabric to the point that business can't go on. Yeah. It cannot go on. And when that comes, then we got a big problem in Asia where seven out of ten people in the world are going to live. We don't want to go there again. Thank We've you. We've been there. We don't want to go there again. Very good. Important points. <coughs> Take turn, Lambert, honey. Yes. Um, uh, I'm a bit afraid that uh, my previous interventions uh, gave the impression that uh, nothing's happening among <laughs> the three countries. Actually, the reality is just the uh, opposite. There are many cooperations going on among the three countries. Uh, if the three countries have the common interest or common concern, for example, in the area of uh, environmental protection, all three countries are uh, worried about the current uh, uh, air pollution uh, situation over there. Um, <clears throat> and also in the cultural area or disaster <coughs> management. Uh, so I just want to emphasize that. But what I wanted to say is that uh, we should now start considering uh, collaboration in political military uh, area. Mm. And uh, well, definitely I think that uh, very strong leadership is necessary uh, to uh, talk about in institutionalizing uh, this mm. area of cooperation. Thank you very much. Last 30 seconds, Farago. I think the, the point about uh, both Russia and becoming or having a more of a political and military role for the trilateral cooperation uh, entities uh, is a significant point because given all of the um, diplomatic talk about how to <coughs> deal with North Korea, I think that's very significant. And whether it's the uh, discussions about special economic zones or railways and other projects, I think we can see a solution uh, to North Korea that, that is an embodiment of this idea of more connectivity being mm -hmm. an important way of, of calming uh, territorial and military uh, tensions. One thing, though, that we didn't talk about is urbanization, mm. right? And this is one of the most rapidly urbanizing areas of the world. Uh, this is the networks among cities and businesses within cities, and that connectivity is really a, a crucial part of what will form an Asian um, a network, if you will, a network, uh, you know, orbit that involves business, government, civil society, and that is going to be a very important stabilizing factor in the future. I think that's something we should pay a lot more attention to. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you, all the participants, for um, being here. A round of applause. I want to thank everybody in the room, everybody who contributed. And uh, uh, Karen, if you sit down, then I can see the camera. Because I also want to thank uh, uh, those who followed us on TV, on webcast, uh, from the World Economic Forum on East Asia in Manila. And I also want to conclude by saying that this is a line of work that we are going to continue to develop in the World Economic Forum. I think we see from this very rich panel the relationship between geoeconomics and geopolitics and security. As the Admiral very uh, importantly pointed out, there, there, is, there is a limit to globalization. And it's happened before. If you look, before 1914, we had a strong development of a globalizing world, and then it all collapsed. So if the going gets really tough, you, it will have very serious implications for business, which is why we don't want that to happen. 
and which is we need to see the interrelationship between all these issues and this is uh, to be continued thank you for the attention and thank you for the attention on everybody on webcast as well thank you